Last week, we began our journey into 1 Peter. Um, if you remember, we looked at the background of the letter that Peter is writing to the first major round of widespread persecution in the church. And we looked at the fact that people weren't quite, I mean, people were being martyred for the gospel, but they weren't being martyred in masses yet. But to, to, to take a stand and say, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, meant you might get mistreated by the government. You might be cast out at work. And it also meant that if your spouse wasn't following Jesus, you might be single by the end of the week. And all these factors of persecution were starting to come in to the lives of the church. And so Peter writes this letter and we looked at what is the purpose of the letter. We, we saw that the purpose of the letter is to encourage, to exhort the church to remember whose they are in Christ. And that was our final point last week was remember your resume. Remember who you are. And we looked at the fact that we are chosen by God. Before time began, God chose us and sent the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to set us apart. And Jesus on the cross accomplished that salvation for us. We looked at the fact that the, the spilt blood of Jesus carries out the sacrificial system of the covenant that we saw with Moses in Exodus 24, that, that when we put our trust and faith in the fact that Jesus died for us and his blood was spilt for us, we are saved. But then as we put our trust and faith and come under the blood of Jesus, it seals our covenant to obey his word. Just like when Moses sprinkled blood on the people in Exodus 24, it sealed their covenant to do what God said. And because we stand in God's grace as chosen sons and daughters, we have peace. The more and more persecution floods into our lives, floods into the early church, our current state, and if God tarries, the future church, the more we stand in His grace and embrace the persecution and stand strong, the more we have peace. And so Peter ended verse 2 with, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So this morning, as we continue on in our journey, our journey of 1 Peter, I would invite with you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. This morning, we will be looking at the next section of 1 Peter. We'll be in verses 3 through 12. So if you would, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and I will read that for us. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this letter that Peter wrote, Lord, this letter that you inspired him to write and that you preserved for us in the canon of scripture that we can study it. 1900 years later, God, and be encouraged and be exhorted by it. Father, I just pray that you'll speak through me. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your law this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's important to remember what we studied last week because this morning in verse 3, Peter comes out 
praising God. He starts off in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's coming off writing about the fact that the entire triune Godhead was involved in saving us. Remember, God the Father chose us, the Holy Spirit sanctified us, and Jesus Christ accomplished it. Every single time someone gives their lives to Christ, the entire triune Godhead is involved in that. And so Peter had just opened up his letter. Hey, it's me, Peter, writing to you Christians who are dispersed, who feel like exiles because of your choice to follow Jesus. And you know what? It wasn't actually your choice. It was God who chose you, sanctified you, and accomplished it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we think about salvation, when we think about all that went into just saving us, it should cause us to respond like Peter does here. Every time, if you're like sitting in class and you're like, 2x plus y equals, woo, I'm saved! And your teacher's like, what? And you're like, blessed be the God and Father. Teacher, let me tell you about this. And you're now you're just preaching the gospel to your class, or maybe you're at work and you're like, oh man, interest rates aren't doing too Whoa, woo, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. Every time we think about the fact that God saved us, chose us, sanctified us, accomplished it, it should lead us to praise like this. And that's what Peter's doing in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he keeps going. How were we saved? According to God's great mercy. According to God's great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope. So not only does God not give us what we deserved, which was hell, According to his great mercy in not sending us to hell, he keeps blessing us in his grace. According to his great mercy, that's how we're saved. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And this is accomplished again through Jesus, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Wow. When you think about that, that should spark praise in all of us. As we think about that truth, we should all be going about our days saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning I've entitled my message, God is good. All the time. And all the time, we're, we're not quite that kind of church yet, but maybe one day, you never know. Times can change. Um, God, our God is good. And so that's the title of our sermon. As we move into our first point this morning, our first point is, our God is awesome. One of the most dear brothers and pastors in my life who has been there through, for me through my darkest days, in my highest days, and then back into my darkest days, and back, he, I always tell Allie, I just love, you know he loves God when he turns the pages of his Bible. He'll just, we'll just be sitting there talking, and like, he'll just start gingerly turning, and like, John, read this for me. And it's like, boom, conviction. But I emailed him about you guys and just giving him an update on my life and telling him about Gateway. And I said, Gateway Bible Church is awesome. And he responded saying, I would never use the word awesome to describe anything other than God. And I was like, whoa, like what is, I was like, okay, you know, well, maybe, maybe he misunderstood. I was like, the church is awesome. And, and so Allie and I went to their house and we were talking with them. And I said, can you just let me know what you meant by that? And he said that only God is awesome. Because when we think about God, it causes us to be in awe of him. And there, there's really nothing on earth. If, if the word awesome is tied to God, how can we tie it to anything underneath that? And it's, it's really convicted me because I realize how often I throw a, around that word. I love you, Gateway Bible Church, but you don't really spark me into a state of awe. But when I think about God choosing me, sanctifying me, and accomplishing it on the cross, that sparks awe in me, and that should spark awe in all of us. And so as we think about our first point, our God is awesome, and truly He's the only awesome thing to ever be. And I know we could say, like, wow, that sunset was awesome. Yeah, it was because our amazing God created that sunset. And as we look at that and think God created that, it puts us in awe of our amazing Father. 
Our God is awesome. Peter in verse one, after in verse three here, after he gives praise to God, he says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. I love that, that he caused us. God saves us. That alone should be enough. And, and I was thinking about this as I was studying. Imagine if I was, <laughs> I mean, imagine if I was a soldier. First off, start laughing at that thought. But imagine if I was a Navy SEAL and I go over to Iraq in the, in the height of the war and I'm at battle and rather than taking the life of an enemy who has their gun pointed at me to take a life, I save him. I get him out of the battle. I'm like, hey, hey, I'm not going to kill you today. Like, hey, just go be on your own. I could have taken his life, but I could spare his life and save him. And he would be thankful like, wow, thank you, sir. I get to go home to my wife. But imagine this. Imagine if I save him and I bring him back into the barracks. And I'm like, hey, here's my dinner, shower, whatever you need. Here's, here's this. And on top of that, I'm like, hey, I want to take you back home. You're part of my family now. Like, here's my wife. Here's my kids. Here's your new bedroom. Here's the keys to the car. Here's money. Here's what you need. You guys are like, what, what are you doing? That's your enemy. Why is he now a part of your family? According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Church, we don't even deserve to be saved. Our sin has separated us from God. But the love of God, he sent his son down to die for us, to make a way to us, to him. And that should have been enough. It should have been enough like, hey, you know what? You're not going to go to hell for eternity. You're just going to live on earth for eternity. If that was all we got, that is far more than we deserve. But he doesn't stop there. He could have stopped there and it would have already been far more than we deserve. But it says has caused us to be born again to a living hope. I know that word living hope, we sing about it a lot, especially when we sing Phil Wickham songs or back when we did youth group, I played living hope almost every other week because it's just a good go-to song. I could have Sean come up and play it on the drums right now with his eyes closed. He played it so many times with me. But what does it actually mean, living hope? We throw that word around a lot in the church. And as believers... We live with hope because of what is to come, what we have waiting for us in heaven. And, and first off, this manifests itself in two ways. First, we have faith in a living God who defeated death and is alive and reigning in heaven. And he chose us and we know that we have this eternal inheritance waiting for us. So every day when we wake up, we live with hope in what's to come. But on the flip side, the fact that Jesus Christ raised from the dead and defeated death, that our Savior, our God, is living, that should give us hope that everything that's promised in Scripture is going to come to be in eternity. And, and in verse 3 here he says, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So that, that hope goes on again. Like I said, we have hope that our Savior is living and reigning in heaven, but we also have hope that we too will rise again and be in heaven with God forever. Our God is awesome. He saves us from hell, causes us to be born again, to be a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus, but he does, he's not done. God is awesome. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. We are born again to an inheritance. And, and I'm going to get to what our inheritance is, but I want, to, I want to camp out on reborn, born again there. When we are reborn, our identity changes. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. And as a result of that, our inheritance is the same as Jesus Christ's. Our inheritance is heaven. When I was born on Tuesday, March 22nd, 1994 at 2.01 a.m. to Mike and Aaron Augusta, I was born into American citizenship. I was born into an upper middle class family and that comes with everything. I was born into motorcycles, mountain bikes, going to a good school, getting 
coffee kiosk scones almost every day for breakfast. Just by being born, I inherited all these things. I, I mean, just to have an American passport in this world is a big deal. And I got that just by being born. I didn't have to go through a class. I didn't have to be on a waiting list. Nope. I didn't even choose to be born. I just got it. And now, I mean, selfishly, I hope that I'll inherit more one day. But if all I got as a result of my birth is what I just listed, that's pretty good. But Paul here, I mean, Peter here says that God has caused us, set into motion, us to be born again to a living hope. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So by birth, I was born to Mike and Aaron Augusta. I was born into the inheritance and the lifestyle that comes with that. But on, in July of 2007, when I got saved, I was born again into an inheritance far greater than anything I could ever get here on earth. And when you're saved, when each and every single one of us puts our trust and faith in Jesus, we are born again to a living hope. Whatever our past life was, whatever the ick and gross sin that we had, it's no more. We are a new creation, a new identity. And that's why the gospel will bring so much hope to people all around the world. I see believers in Honduras who, who don't have anything and they are so filled with hope because they know that God changes everything. This isn't the end for them. They're going to go to streets of gold. They're going to go to where there's no pain, no more tears because of God, because God causes us to be born again. Church, we would, God causes this to happen because we would never choose it on our own. Sin blinds us to think that what we have here on earth is enough. Imagine if I thought that everything I had here on earth was enough and I didn't need Jesus, I'd be missing out on an eternity of blessing, on, an, on this eternal inheritance that is promised to us and given to us graciously through God. God chose us, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, and Jesus accomplishes our salvation because God knew that on our own, we would never choose him. And not only does he do this, but he causes us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Our inheritance is in heaven is never going to end. It will never pass away. Our inheritance is undefiled. It's pure. It's never going to lose its luster, its brightness, or its strength. And it's ours forever. It's unfading. That means that, you know, you get the new toy for Christmas. Well, let me just talk about my brother here for a second. At the, at the motocross race, he bought, no, no, for Christmas, my grandma got him a, the brand new toy dirt bike. I saw him the next day. It was broken. He got this new toy dirt bike on December 25th. He was so excited about it. And on December 26th, the rear shock had blown out and it was broken. Our inheritance in heaven is never going to lose its luster, its excitement, its strength. Every single second of every single day, it's going to be just as amazing, just as awesome, just as exciting as it was when we got there. And that's going to go on for eternity. It's never going to end. It's never going to be defiled and it's never going to fade. And guess what? Guess what Peter says here in, in verse four? It's being kept in heaven for us. Right now, as we sit here, all the promises of God, our entire inheritance, all the glory is being kept in heaven. It's not like it's, it's being passed out, you know, like at a bank, your money's there. It's a number on a screen, but maybe Dave comes and, and withdraws a hundred dollars and it's a brand new crispy bill. And then I come and I withdraw a hundred dollars and it's a withered old hundred dollar bill. That's gross. No, no, no. 
our inheritance is being kept in heaven for us. It's not going to be passed around and shared. It's not community property. No, no. It's being held for us. Here's, I love this. Look at verse 5. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So let me backtrack here. Peter opens up verse 3, praising God for our salvation. And then he reminds us that not only are we saved through the entire triune Godhead, but we're caused to be born again to a living hope. We live with hope because our hope is living. And that's Jesus at the right hand of God. We're born into a new identity, a new inheritance that only comes through God. And our inheritance is never going to end ever. And it's being kept in heaven for us right now. And now he's going to change it to us. It's being kept in heaven for us. And us, we, verse 5, are being guarded by God's power. Whoa, God's power. Not angel number one's power. Not a couple angels around. No, no, no. We are being guarded by the power of Almighty God. Remember a few weeks ago when we looked at that our hope is only found in Jesus, one of the points in Ephesians 1 was that th through salvation we have full access to God's power. We are being guarded by God's power. And look what it says, through faith. Through faith. John MacArthur says this. He says, Supreme power, omniscience, omnipotence, and sovereignty not only keeps our inheritance, but also keeps the believer secure. No one can steal the Christian's treasure, and no one can disqualify us from receiving it. Our faith is a response to the Holy Spirit convicting our hearts and opening our eyes to see our need for a Savior. And then we put our faith in Jesus. Even our faith is empowered by God. In Ephesians 2, it says that our faith is a result of grace so that no one can boast. Imagine if we all in here said that we earned our salvation. I would never get up here and get a word out because we'd all be down here debating who got saved better. Oh yeah, well I was in a gang and I was in prison when I got saved. You were just homeschooled. Oh yeah, well, I was, I was in the army and I got shot and God saved me on my deathbed and now I'm, it would be nonstop. But salvation is a result of grace so that no one can boast. And even our faith is a result of God. It's Peter, uh, I'm getting Peter and Paul mixed up here. Paul in 2 Corinthians says that when we get saved, the veil is first removed from our heart by God. And when he does that, we see our need for a savior. And when we see our need for a savior, we run to him and we put our faith in him, but we can't remove that veil on our own. It's God who does it. And here in verse five, Peter says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. Our faith is permanent. It's never ending. It's being powered by God. What does that mean? When we're tempted to doubt, when we're tempted to, to waver on things because times are hard, God is strengthening us. It's the Holy Spirit in us that brings to mind the word of God that allows us to learn it, to internalize it, to grow. And God strengthens us to step through those trials. God not only gives the new life, not, God not only causes us to be born again, but he sustains us in the new life and gives us everything we need to move forward. Doesn't that, doesn't that want, make you want to praise him, church? Growing up, I knew that if, if we were going to go to Magic Mountain or Disneyland or to the motocross track or go on a trip or do something special, I was always on my best behavior. Yes, mom, I'd love to do that. Oh, the trash needs to be taken out? Well, I'd love to do that. I didn't want any of my actions to jeopardize the festivities to come. And if my best friend was here this morning, he loves to bring up this one story. But we we're in junior high. We we're going to go to the motocross track. And he's always asking me, can I go with you? Can I go with you? Can I? Yeah, sure. Come on. So 
He gets to my house after school on Friday. We pack up the truck. We get everything ready. And, and we have a sleepover. And on Saturday morning, we're like, Dad, you ready to go? Ready to go? He's just sitting there. He said, no, we're not going to the track. Because sometime during the week, I had skipped a chore or didn't do the chore correctly. And so Saturday morning came. We were all excited to go to the track. And poof, nope, we're not going to the track anymore. So my friend went home. I unloaded the truck. And my dad had a list of chores ready to go for the rest of my Saturday. And if my friend was here, he loves to tell that story because he was so excited to finally go to the track and it didn't happen. But that isn't the case with God. He's not going to tell us about this inheritance. Let us get excited about it. And then one day be like, sorry, not going to happen. That this inheritance is promised to us. It's being kept by us. And by the power of God alone, our faith is going to get us to that inheritance one day, and it's never going to fade away. How awesome is our God? The second point this morning is perspective shift. I couldn't think of anything better than that. I'm sorry. Perspective shift. As we move on in verse 6, we're going to get back to praising, church, because look at what Peter says. In this you rejoice. So he reminds us that we're saved by the entire triune Godhead and then starts blessing God for it, goes into a little praise moment. And then he reminds us that because we're saved by God, everything that comes with it, our entire inheritance. So we have our inheritance and now Peter's saying, in this you rejoice. So we're praising God again for our inheritance. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Huh. Peter, I thought we were on the on a having a little praise party here. Now you bring up trials. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. This is such a loaded verse, church, and, and I, I took a little big chunk here going 3 through 12. We could do a whole sermon this morning just on these two verses alone. But he says various trials. We're going to work a little backwards here. Peter is fully aware that the, the church he's writing to at the time and us and any believer to come is going to face trials. And I think a lot of people get off the boat of Christianity the minute life gets hard. I think a lot of people come to Jesus thinking like, oh man, okay, if I just come to church and do all the right things, my life is going to be smooth sailing. And the minute something goes wrong, they go, why am I going to keep doing this if my life is just as hard? I want to go have fun and party. No, no, no. Peter is aware that trials are going to come and they're going to come in all shapes and sizes. And, and so he, he puts it here. He says, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. He could have just said by trials or by some trials, but he says various because trials come to each and every one of us in different packages, different ways, different shapes and sizes. But as we work backwards, that word right before by various, he says, you have been grieved. In church, he doesn't say rejoice and don't grieve your trials. He says in this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved. Trials aren't fun. There's nothing fun about a trial. Trials bring pain, they bring sorrow, and they bring grief. And Peter's aware of this. In church, we are, he was a warm-blooded human just like the rest of us. He's not deceived to the fact that trials stink. And I think a lot of times in church, we, we have this idea of like, we, we, we just say, in this you rejoice in trials. And we kind of take out the, if necessary, you've been grieved part. And I want to point that out because trials stink and trials cause us to grieve. And church, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to be hurt by a trial, to be in pain. I struggle with this one, so, so I don't. But men, it's okay to cry. 
Ali and I were doing an anniversary book last night and because we skipped it, we're a month late, but it, it says, what is something you learned about each other this year? And Ali wrote that John really hates when people cry. And she wrote that I'll leave the room. And it is, crying makes me uncomfortable because I was raised in a family like, oh, you're crying, I'll give you a reason to cry. And so I always joke that I remove my tear ducts. They don't exist. But Peter here is acknowledging the fact that trials bring pain and pain brings grief. And so church, part of going through a trial, part of all the promises here of trials is grief. That's a stage of the trial. That's a stage of growth is to grieve the trial. And when we face trials, it's okay to cry and mourn. However, in those trials, as we look to the cross with tear-filled eyes, we should be comforted knowing that this is all one day going to be gone. And like we read in Revelation this morning, there's going to be no tears. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no suffering, no more pain in heaven when we have that inheritance. As we work backwards in verse 6, he also says, if necessary. Wow, John, that was really comforting what you just said. Like, I finally have permission to cry, and now you're going to say there's a need for trials if necessary? Yes, God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he uses the trials in our lives to grow us. And, and Peter explains why in verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Church, we're going to face many trials many various kinds. We're going to face a medley of trials in our lives. And it's okay to grieve those. Peter's aware of it. Even Jesus wept when he saw people mourning the death. But what happens is we don't stay there. With tear-filled eyes, we look to the cross of Christ and remember what is promised, what we're born again to, a living hope, an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. And trials have a purpose. Peter writes here that we're going to face various trials if necessary. And the necessary, the, the need for trials is to make us more like God. Peter says that gold is tested by fire. The only way to purify gold is to put it into a burning hot furnace over and over again to get the impurities out of it. The finest metal in the world is going to perish one day. And it's even tested by fire. But our faith is never going to end because our faith is being powered by God himself. And as we go through these trials, when life gets hard, when we're crying, when it, when it seems like there's no end in sight, and we remember, God, even if this is the rest of my life, you're still good and I'm going to be in heaven with you one day. As, we, put our, as we, we stand in God's grace and we get that peace that comes knowing, you know what, this is all temporary because one day I'm going to be in heaven. And as our faith is strengthened, as we see God's goodness despite the trial, not despite, but in spite of the trials, as we're in the trial and we're suffering, but we see God's goodness and with tears in our eyes, we look and we remember the cross. Our faith will be tested and our faith will be strengthened. And as a result of that, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's two factors here, church. As, as you're going through trials and people see how rough your life is and they see the hope that you're just trudging along with hope because you have faith in Jesus, they're going to want to know this Jesus because there's a lot of people who would end things, who would turn to substances or, or just quit whatever they're doing and you turn. But if you're just going in faith and people see that, it's going to result in people turning their eyes to Jesus and giving him praise and glory. But there's also 
going to be praise and glory and honor for us at the revelation of Jesus Christ when we arrive to heaven's gates after marching through the various trials of life and faith. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. servant. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. And for eternity, we're in the glory of God. Trials have a purpose. They're not fun. It's okay to grieve trials. It's okay to cry and to mourn and to feel pain. But in those trials, we need to change our perspective. And rather than sitting here going, oh, my life is terrible. Woe is me. I'm not getting enough sympathy. Woe is me. My life is so... No, no, we need to take our perspective and shift it back to the cross of Christ because it was accomplished with Jesus on the cross. And this life is soon going to be passed and we're going to be in heaven with God for eternity, with an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Church, that is being kept in heaven for us. That is yours today if your trust and faith is in Jesus. It's not maybe, you're not playing roulette in Vegas. No, 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 no. That is ours. It's being kept in heaven, and we ourselves are being guarded by the power of God himself. And all of this is because God himself caused us to be born again to a living hope. God is so good, church. And, and in, as we go into verse 8, Peter writes, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter was with Jesus here on earth. He walked like, how cool would it be to know what Jesus' voice sounded like? I know you guys are like, hey, you should come to church with me. My pastor has a really high pitch, annoying voice. How cool would it be to know what Jesus' voice sounded like? How tall he was? Like, you know, when you shake his hand, was it a firm grip? What was it like? Like, Peter knew all these things. He walked with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He bunked with Jesus. He was one of the chosen ones that got to go up the hill and see Jesus be transfigured. He was the, the lead disciple, the lead apostle. And what he says here. He's just marveling at the church. Though you have not seen him, you love him. He's like, I've seen him. I know Jesus. And I, I didn't even, I denied him. But you don't even, you've never seen him. And you love him. And though you don't now see him, you still believe in him. And you rejoice in him. Church, we've never seen God. We've never seen Jesus. But what we've seen is his work. We've, we've experienced the Holy Spirit inside of us, and that's what faith is. And Peter here in verses 8 through 9 is saying, it's amazing to see your faith through trials because you've never seen him and you love him. You still, like, you've gone through this trial and you still don't see him, but you still believe in him. And as we do that, it, it just sparks this inexpressible joy in us. And only those of us who are born again know that joy where we just have this hope inside of us. Yes, life is hard. Yes, I'm grieving, but I know what's to come because I have faith and love in God in heaven. Church, I, as I was studying for this, I kept having this thought. I wasn't going to say this in my message this morning, but the more and more I was studying, I kept having this thought come to mind. And, and in my mind, it's Sean doing the action I'm about to describe. Sorry, Sean, just, you were the perfect fit for this. But if I was to put on the back table a, a suitcase with $10 million cash back there, and then have Sean stand here, and then all the chairs were just burning hot coals, like fire, lava. And I said, Sean, all you have to do is just run to the back as fast as you can. First off, Sean would say, can I run around? No, no, no. This whole place is full of burning hot coals. I say, Sean, all you have to do is sprint across to the back. That $10 million is yours. 
If there was nothing on the back, you'd be like, oh man, I don't know, my feet might get hot. But when you see that there's $10 million cash that's yours, Sean would probably be like, all right, five, I could probably do it in seven steps if I leap like a gazelle. I could use a couple thousand of it to get the medical expenses for the skin graft on my feet. <laughs> and then he'd be back there holding the case. Church, life right now, we're here. We're, we're on this earth. We're elect exiles away from our home. This is our life until we reach heaven. On the backside, you can see it. That is your eternity waiting for you. When you put your perspective where it needs to be on the cross of Christ, it changes everything. When you can see what's waiting for you and you know that that is guaranteed for you, it makes this a lot less painful. Yes, it's going to hurt Sean as he runs across the coals. There's no mistaking that. But when he's holding a suitcase of $10 million, it's like, okay. Or like a mother who gives birth. It's excruciatingly painful. But the minute she's holding her baby, I'm an expert on this. The minute she's holding her baby, she forgets the pain. Peter doesn't say life's going to be super easy. He says, no, 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 no. Though now for a while, you're going to be grieved by many trials. Fix your eyes on the cross because it's in this we rejoice. We don't rejoice in this trial, painful life. No, no, we rejoice in our inheritance that is to come. And finally, I know I'm going long again, but our final point this morning is the grass isn't always greener. Look at verse 10 with me. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, Gateway Bible Church, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. When we read stories in the Bible, it's so tempting to think, man, it would be so cool to be there. Like, we all wanted to be there when God parted the Red Sea. That would be so cool to experience. Or, I'm not going to lie, I kind of want to be on the boat with Noah and just see what it looked like to be, I know there'd be like bodies bobbing in the water, but to see the entire world covered. Allie and I were talking about it this week. Like, I would have wanted to see what it looked like when water just burst through the earth. It would have been cool to, to be on the wall with Nehemiah or to, to have met Daniel. That guy was a stud and a half. But if you were to tell all those people of the Old Testament what we have now, they would beg to come now. If you gave them a time machine, they would come to the 21st century where we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, where we have God's word accessible to us. And Peter here is saying, Concerning this salvation, which is ours, which we now have, church, the prophets who prophesied about the grace searched and inquired carefully, going through it, the prophecies that they're writing, wondering, when is this going to come? Is this going to come next week? Is this going to come in a year? Will, will I ever get to see this? And verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, that this amazing salvation that they're writing about would they would never see it in their lifetime they were serving us they were serving the the first century church and all the the years to come until jesus returns and, and the the apostles and all the prophets to come preach about this <coughs> and it's ours church we have it now so if you were to ask the people of old and tell them what we had now, they would say that our grass is pretty green right here because we have full access to God through the Holy Spirit. And I love this final part. He says that this salvation that we have, church, that is ours being kept in heaven for us and that we are being guarded by the power of God through faith, 
It's something that angels long to look at. It's something that angels long to see. Think about this. I didn't think about this while I was studying it. Angels can never experience the salvation that we have. They can never get saved. They're, they're, they are messengers of God. They get to go to and from heaven down to earth. They can never get saved. They cannot understand salvation because they can never be saved. And so it says that every single time uh, someone turns from their sin and puts their trust and faith in God, there is angelic eruptions of praise in heaven. Sometimes if I'm evangelizing to someone in the party scene, I'm like, you like to party? Angels like to party way more than you. There's going to be a massive party in heaven if you give your life to the Lord right now. They do this because they, they cannot comprehend how God would save people who reject him, who hate him, who sin against him, and not only save them, but here's the angels looking down, looking at God. He takes us around and puts us right into his presence. The angels cannot comprehend that. And so our salvation is something that they long to look at. And as they do it, it produces praise and glory in heaven. So church, our God is awesome. He, he saved us and he, he not only saved us, but he planned out our lives. He chose to save us, sanctified us and accomplishes it. And he sets in motion like a little snowball going down a hill. He causes us to be born again into this inheritance. Not only that, but he's keeping the inheritance for us and, and empowering us and empowering our faith to get there. And we're aware that life's going to be hard, but when we change our perspective to be on the cross, this temporary fleeting life has no power over us because of what's to come. And finally, church, what we have now through the Holy Spirit, through our access at all times to God himself, is something that the prophets of old earnestly searched and hoped that they would see and something that angels long to look at. It's ours and it's been given to us by God. And so as you leave today and you go and you're in this life and you're tempted to, to doubt, you're tempted to, to grieve and to mourn and think, this isn't, this isn't enough. Like there's gotta be something better. No, no, no. Shift your perspective back to the cross because there's a good God who loves you. And he's given this all to you through his son, Jesus Christ. Gateway Bible Church, we serve a good, good God. And we're sitting here this morning as a result of his sovereignty and as a result of the entire triune Godhead choosing us by name.